What was your decision making process when making that move and how did you react to some of the negative backlash? At the end of the day, you're building the asset to turn into something. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, would you want to own 100% of nothing? But we're here in season. We got a very, very special guest. None other than the legendary Swiss. Pioneer in the game of hip hop, pioneer in the game of business. We got a lot to talk about, man. We're going to cover it all. Swiss, my brother, what's going on, man? All good, all good. Happy to be here. Yeah, man, long time coming, so we had to really roll out the red carpet for you, man. I appreciate it. Good food, <laughs> nice drinks, good backdrops, beautiful backdrop. <laughs> the garden behind us. This is this epic moment. This, this feels New York. Well, yeah, this know, is New York. <laughs> it's, it's only right. It's only right. So, um, so much to talk about, man. I want to get straight to it. The first thing I want to talk about is what we just talked about off camera is art. Okay. I know that you know you you are a collector and a lover of art, and it's interesting because most people have no idea like how to value art as an investment. Mm. Right? You just see something, it looks good, I I like it. Mm. Um, but we recently have been educated on art. Um, spoke to Troy Carter, one of your friends, about art and a variety yes. of other people. So, when did you get into art, and can you give us some education on how to actually invest in art? Um, I got into art just growing, being in St. Mary's Project, just being in the Bronx. Art was always around me, you know, so art and music, they was always around me. Those are brothers and sisters, you know, a lot of mm -hmm. people, the art business, the music business, but since you've known art and music, they always been together in some type of way, whether it was on fashion, whether it was on your album cover or whatever the case may be. Um, so naturally, just growing up in the Bronx, I just always had it around me. And I used to do graffiti. My tag name was was Loco, um, but I didn't know I didn't know that it was as I didn't know it was a thing, you know. Like because when 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 it's so close to you, you just you see it every day. Like oh, that's just you know that's just a painting. That's just right. But then as I grew older, I was like oh, you know this is this is something that's that's special. And um, when I got into it, I got into art by I bought my first place like around 18. I wanted to decorate it and I didn't want like no posters and stuff like that. I wanted to put some real zone on my walls. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I started going to the art galleries and I couldn't believe how expensive it was for what they were showing me. I was like, 50,000 for what? What are you talking about? Like, <laughs> like, oh, this is the wall hall. It's really abstract. And this is the this and tell me all these stories about, about the artists. And um, I didn't just jump in, into it because like, I just didn't, I, I felt like they was trying to take advantage of me. And then I just started learning more about it and just learning the value of what's what. Like, okay, it's an AP, this is an artist proof. This is a G Clay, this is that, this is, and why the prices were. And until so that made sense to me, I didn't buy anything. Um, my first piece was the Ansel Adams photography. I always loved photography. And it was a it was a picture of a mountain because I just felt like it just was a place that I wanted to go. I wanted to I wanted to be at that destination. You know, um, I always loved photography. My grandfather was a photographer, and um, now you know the Dean Collection is the biggest collector in Gordon Parks. Uh, period. But as far as the investment part, I can't I can't say that I looked, ever looked at art as an investment. You know, I looked at a piece. And if it connected to me and if it spoke to me, that's the piece that I got, you know. Um, now, being around the right artist, that takes time. Like, you're going to develop your eye. And I don't really like, like, as far as an, an investment, that's, that, just, that just comes, you know. Like, I, I don't really have people buy art as an investment because... I just think that it gets too technical at that point, right? Like, if you're going to support an artist, you should support them. And if that work go up in value, that's a plus. Mm. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It shouldn't be, like, everybody feel like, it's, this is not the stock exchange. You know what I'm saying? Like, this is not, like, people treat it like that, but it's not fair for the artist. You know, like, you should support an artist throughout their career and, you know, and, and, 
you're going you're going to luck up on some great works and then that value going to naturally go up like the portfolio that that I that we built for the Dean collection is you know I've been collecting for 22 years you know a lot of the artists that works that I got they they're not they don't have a market their market is not strong and maybe it'll be strong one day you know like so you just got to give 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 time for the artist work to appreciate for it to grow and then um, then that value makes more sense. Yeah, but in, in yeah. a sense though, it's like when you add a piece to your collection at this point, you've been in it for 22 years, mm -hmm. you alone having it sets the market, right? Because it's like it's part of the Dean collection, it's something that yeah. you've established, which is interesting to look at it, right? Because you started out just as a, you know what, I like this. I'm not thinking about the value, but me, now me having it gives value to not only this painting, but the artist going forward. Did you ever, Imagine that it would be like that end of the spectrum. No, I never, I never thought that we would like set the tone for a whole market, you know, which we did um, in African and African American art. Like mm -hmm. I remember, no gallery had African and African American art. Now every gallery has it to the biggest in the world. And I remember, you know, when I was going to look for art, they, there was no, they wasn't showing me no Kahendes. They, the only person they were showing me was Basquiat, right? Like, they wasn't showing so many other great artists. So, you know, I was collecting Miro, Chagall, Sam Francis, all these other Warhols, Herons, because that's the only thing that was in the galleries at that time. And then um, I started meeting a lot of prolific artists on my own. I'm like, wait a minute, why is this not in the gallery? Damn, why is this not in the gallery? And then I also was going to my pair's house and I didn't see no artists really of color but then when I go to like business people house, I see Garden Parks, I see, you know, Kehinde, and I'm like, wait a minute, like, this house seems blacker than mine, <laughs> right? Yeah. And then I realized that when I went to Kehinde's retrospect at the Brooklyn Museum and I didn't see no last names of color, I was like, nah, this is crazy. And, and then Kehinde was just like, yo, you know, I'm, I'm used to it now. And I, and I was like, you shouldn't get used to that. And then that's when, you know, I offered to buy a significant piece from that show, which was the only piece that he owned in that show. Um, and then we just started changing the dynamics and started breaking the records at Sotheby's and just pushing the envelope and, and creating that marketing. Um, and then Diddy got the um, the Kerry James Marshall, you know, which, which I was a part of putting that sale together for him, which made Kerry James the, the highest paid living artist in the world of color, you know, so these are landmarks and different things that forge that market to go to where it's at today. Uh, but it's, 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 been, it's been a crazy ride. Yeah. What do you think about Web3 NFTs when it comes to art? Not like just the board ape, like the monkeys and stuff like that, but <laughs> the actual utility as far as like being able to get commission on the sale. Cause I look at like, I believe Basquiat is his painting sold for like a hundred million dollars or something like that a few years ago. But they said when he was alive, the most he ever got was 100000 mm -hmm. But if he would have had that commission on it, let's say 10%, now his estate would get $10 million yeah. for that sale, right? So when I looked at, when I was educated on NFTs, the utility part of it, as far as authenticating that it's actually real, because I know, you know, it's a lot of forgery in the art world, the commission, I was like, this is a great thing for artists. Mm -hmm. um, how do you feel about that? I think it's great. You know, we we have this thing called the Dean's Choice, which, you know, we've been speaking to Christy Sotheby's and Phillips with, and I actually did it with the um, Kerry James Marshall because the main piece sold for like 22 million and everything about that was a victory. But then I was like, damn, like Kerry James is not getting that from this sale. And so when we did the preview, the owner of that piece you know, I gave a speech about how we got to change this energy for living artists. And, um, and he, he caught the message. And so the study of that piece, he gave a piece of that. He gave a piece, he sold that um, through another one of my, um, I, did like, I did like a sale with, with Sotheby's and he gave Kerry James a piece of that. And so that already proved that that can happen. And so the Dean Choices, if I'm the I'm the the seller, I'm the I'm the the collector. When I come to bring Sotheby's to work, 
your Sotheby's, you're going to say, okay, you got this piece 10 years ago, you're making 700% on your money or whatever the crazy ass number is. The artist is still living. How much do you want to give to the artist? And you make it your choice because it don't matter to me. Like if it's 5%, if it's 10%, it's a hundred percent more than they're getting now, right? And and it's your choice. So you either a patron of the arts or you're greedy as hell. Right? And so, but if this is not being put in front of people, then they're gonna be like, nobody told me to do that. Right. And so the reason why it works is because it's not taking money off of anyone's table. Mm -hmm. The collectors making seven hundred percent. Sotheby still keep their twenty percent from the sale. The artists get paid as well, and, and I think this is the solution. Um, and and we're going, we going for it heavy because the artists deserve it. If I get paid um, royalties on, on my work as a musician, what, why can't the, the visual artists get paid? I think that's ridiculous. Right, exactly. right. That's a game changer. Yeah. One of the other things you talked about earlier was not only just collecting art, but I know you have one of the, in my opinion, one of the best watch collections. Thank you. And so I wonder when you look at that, is that, are you approaching it the same way? Not as investment, more as like, yo, this is a, something that has a purposeful meaning behind it, or I like the designer. How do you go about approaching, well, buying other collectibles? Well, I think just the art of collecting is something that is not really taught to our culture. And we're the, we're the biggest consumers in the world of goods. You know, like, um, the, difference, the difference is that we got to just start traveling more. You know, like, like when I was um, designing from designing Zenith watches, like in the factory, you know, designing even, you know, now Debitune, um, working with Audemars on the, on the carbon concept, um, designing the, the Aston Martin Ford over with, with Merrick Richmond, all these different design things that, you know, instead of just buying everything, like we need to go and do more homework and, and, and get more inquisitive on what we actually spending all our money on. Mm -hmm. Right, so for, so for me, I always like to take the risk, right? Like, so everybody's buying the same watches, everybody's buying the same cars. For me, like right now on the watch tip, I'm just doing all independence, you know, because like I see the growth there, you know. These watches, like say the Eurek that I have on now, is like 10 in the world, right? And everybody's chasing a, a particular brand that everybody had, but so many people got that same watch and right now for like half the price, you can get a watch that's 10 in the world, right? So it's just like, in the next five years, I know where these are gonna be, and you're just catching it while, while nobody's paying attention, and then all of a sudden you have a, you have a collection of something that's unique, mm. um, because you're spending unique money. Um, just, like, just like what Hove said in the verse, he was like, people spending real money on fake watches. You see what I'm saying? And, I just, I just thought that was, I just thought that was a, a unique line, like, and I, cause I understood what he was saying, and you know, we we got to have our own identity sometimes, you know, like, like, take the risk and just be different, you know, and, and that's what I just, I try to do in the art, I try to do with the watches, with the cars, all of it. But it's so, it's like you said, it's just, it's a lot to do with education too, cause I, I got a, I recently got an AP and I took it to Sotheby's to, to get appraised because I had to get insurance on it and. Mm -hmm. um, Long story short, they told me like APs, that particular watch, well APs in general, it dropped like 30%. Mm -hmm. So they're like, don't even, don't even get it appraised because it'll probably be lower than the retail value. Mm -hmm. And it was a whole, and they actually, it was a great conversation that I had with the girl at Sotheby's, but I didn't know that. <laughs> it took me a year and a half to actually get the watch. I'm like, damn, by the time I got it, it dropped 30%. So it was like, if I would've knew that, I might not have got the watch. Yeah. But I didn't know that until I actually got it. Yeah, well I think, you know, the, the thing is, is like a lot of the different things that have value in it is not in front of us every day. You know, like, like this watch is not probably being promoted in front of you. Mm -hmm. AP is a very big company. Rolex is a very big company. They marketing dollars is very targeted on how they want to move. And a lot of those watches, uh, they do have value. Like, you know, like I remember I had, a, I had braids in my hair with my first AP all diamond factory. I was on the cover of Dub Magazine when the first Maybach came out with an AP <laughs> on. People thought that was a Rolex at that time. You know, then when I came with Hublot, people thought that was an AP. You know what I'm saying? And when I came with Richard Mills, people thought that was a Hublot. 
right? And so, like, you know, like, even now. And I um, think that's a Richie Mill. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, like, there's a consistent theme here. Yeah, Switch yeah. is setting the trend every single time. <laughs> if you haven't noticed. <laughs> What's that watch called? Yurik. Yurik. Yeah. So, you, you said something about, and this is something that people take for granted or don't do enough of, and that's travel. Mm -hmm. And so, when you travel, you start to see everything as an opportunity. It's one of yeah. the things that we've been noticing in, in our travels over the past uh, three or four years. How has the impact of going to different places and being exposed to different opportunities changed the way you look at your investments? I mean, traveling has been like, besides inve in investing into my education, going back to school, traveling has been like a big asset to me because it's easy to play in that same sandbox but to step outside and to see like, there's so much more life out there. There's so much more culture out there. It just, it just makes your confidence high as well. Like when you're like, oh, they trying to like lock us in over here. Mm -hmm. It's really a big ass world that we're invited to, you know? And when I go places, I, I do it for real. Like I go from the basement to the penthouse. Like I don't just go and just be in the penthouse you gotta go to the basement. Like, you know, I've, I've sat in the, in the desert with the Bedouins and, and ate food with, with, with the families there, you know, listen to the music, water outfits, water cologne, try the herbs, and just like be a student everywhere you go. And it's just so much that, 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 I, that fulfilled me from, from doing that to where I'm, I'm more comfortable out of the country than I'm in, in our own country. You know, the hospitality is way different. Yeah. That's why I asked you where you headed. <laughs> yeah. I don't think I'm like, why are you even here? Yeah, I know you're going to. So I want, let, let's, let's talk about versus. Yeah. Cultural phenomena. Congratulations. Thank on you. starting that. Well, we had a conversation with Tim, um, and that was really dope. So a few different things I want to talk about versus. The first, the first thing is um, the acquisition. Mm. Thriller. Um, it's an interesting conversation because you guys got some backlash. You saw, but that's a common thing. We've been talking to a lot of different people and um, they were saying like, especially in our community, we're not properly educated. And a lot of times people, you know, they have trauma and it's like, oh, you sold out. Yeah. You sold out, that's a very common thing. So yeah. what was your decision-making process when making that move and how did you react to some of the negative backlash on it? Um, the negative backlash, I knew that I knew that people wasn't really educated on what we was doing and, and how we was doing it. You know, um, me going back to school showed me how to build up and um, not sell out, but sell in. Mm. You know, we gotta, we can't just be sitting back and watch all the non-colored uh, entrepreneurs cash out that's called good business. But when we cash out, it's called selling out. Like, I just don't understand that part. And, um, and I never will understand that part because at the end of the day, you're building the asset to, to, to turn into something. You know what I'm saying? Like, would you want to own 100% of nothing? Just to say, like, I own it? You know what I mean? Like, no. Um, the richest person in the world own probably, like, at this point, less than 10% of their company. That's the richest person in the world. And that's what we got to understand like yeah we could own a hundred percent of verses but what we wanted to do was we wanted to take care of all of the artists um, that participated in verses especially at a time of help that was needed mm -hmm. in not just our culture in the world mm -hmm. and so I figured out a structure and we figured out a structure where you know we could bring everybody and make them a part of the IPO um, which is going public because imagine how many platforms that we build that we're never included in. You know, imagine that all of the artists that set off Instagram got a piece of it when it went public, that set off Snapchat, got a piece of it. Like, artists would be like in way better shape. Mm -hmm. We're used to build everything, but we're not a part of nothing when it hit the big stage. And so my thing was like, yo, let's do this deal because the company that we're doing it with hasn't went public yet, and this would be the biggest creative IPO in history. And we, we was just going for the biggest IPO in history for the creatives. Yeah. And so that's, that's why we did that, and, um, and we, we had a great time as well. 
Yeah, yeah, man. It was, it's interesting that you said that because I noticed after being in the game for 25 years, you did go back to school to get an education. You went to Harvard Business School. Yeah. And then some of the deals that you started doing, the transactions, they started to change a little bit. And so you had a record label. You watched your uncles create just a monumental staple in hip hop. Yeah. What inspires you to say, you know what, I need to be even more educated than I have from the experiences that I've had at that point in your career? I went back to school because I just was hitting like a bump in the road where I was maxing out with, with creativity, you know, because, and then I realized that I was doing mergers and acquisitions and bringing companies together and, and was getting paid, but they wasn't really respecting me as a business person in that room. Like they was always talk to me about Grammys or musical questions. I got a suit on. I'm, there's no Swiss in the room. Same thing. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm Kasim in that room, and it just started getting annoying. So I asked one of my one of my friends, super super successful billionaire person. We was on on our way, and I was like, Why do you think this is happening? Because I thought naturally what we're gonna think is is racism, is because of my color and all this stuff here. Then it was just very simple. It's like, yo, they're doing that because they know you don't know the language. Mm. So they don't want to disrespect you. So they want to talk about a topic that they know you're comfortable with. You don't know what a betna is. You don't know what an IPO is. You don't know this. You don't know that. So they don't want to offend you in the meeting. And that's when I was just like, oh, it just made so much sense. And I was like, if I'm going to move forward another 20 year plus, um, I need to sharpen up my education because I started when I was 17 uh, successfully and just been running ever since. So I miss so many things education wise that I was just hitting my head and I was just like getting frustrated because I couldn't print my brain. Now I could take something from Instagram, set it up uh, for IPO, do this, do that, and empower the other artists, things like that. Like, you can't freestyle that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, you have to really yeah. know how to do that. Like, even with no commissions, you understand? Like, built a whole art fair yeah. and came up with a structure to where that, the, the, the company still made money, but we, we didn't charge the artists, we didn't charge the artists anything, yeah. right? And that's something that I had to learn how to do. And then now, when I walk in the room, my confidence is up. I can speak to any, anybody on any level. And I feel that the artists and all creatives, if we invest our time and our education, which is probably about two watches, you know what I'm saying? You, you, you could build a few countries. Yeah. So, you, I mean, it's interesting because you set the trend in music, you set the trend in fashion, definitely with the automobiles. I ain't set it in fashion, though. You know what <laughs> I, I leave that to, to, to P and, 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 and Ye and, and, and Virgil. Well, um, definitely music and collectibles. Yeah, yeah, we can, we can say that. Set the trends. Yeah. I wonder, to, in your opinion, why haven't your counterparts or contemporaries followed this trend of, you know what, let me go back and study the business of this? Few, few of them have. Yeah. Not enough. Yeah, I, I encourage a lot of people to, to do it. A lot of people low-key been doing it. Um, not, not, not like the three-year program that I did, but just having like uh, personal tutors and, and different things like that. I, I know about five. That's, that's out there they doing all, it. They all watch Earn Your Leisure. What that's you mean? Education. Yeah. The that's new that's education. That, that's yeah. the high school. This is the Zah. Exactly. What the real Zah. This is the But let's go back to verses because that's important. I, um, mm -hmm. I don't want to skip over this conversation. So we, when we spoke to um, Tim, he told us that you guys are like one of the largest shareholders in Philip when it becomes public. No, we had a lot, one of the largest shareholders in Trillers now. Before, now, before, before it goes public. public. Yeah. So the play was, that was the original plan from the beginning was to, all right, sell it. But then when we sell it, we're going to make sure that we get shares equity in this company. So it's kind of like a swap in a sense. It was it, like for me, like, um, so just say that we own Universal and Vivendi is the holding company. If I'm going to own it in Vivendi and Vivendi own Versus, don't I still technically own Versus? Right, because you still own, you own right? it. Right, because okay. I'm going to own one of the largest shareholders in the holding company, right? So you gotta be educated to know those particular plays, right? So Trilla at that time had the evaluation at 1.6 billion, right? So I took a, a, a platform and put it into a $1.6 billion evaluation company, became a major shareholder in that company that, that owns Versus, which if 
our own trail our own race, right? So for me, it wasn't it wasn't a um, it wasn't a loss. Like it didn't we didn't lose anything. Mm -hmm. We just set up a, a smarter play, and we didn't dilute no shares, right? So instead of going out there raising a hundred million when people throw around easy, you, 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 let me see you do it, mm -hmm. right? So to own, to, so to raise a hundred million dollars and then still give verses to the people for free, you can't do that. We would have to charge you for every verses to show the revenue stream for at least three years to even get to any of those numbers, mm -hmm. right? So my thing is like, okay, let's not dilute our shares and bring in investors that you got like 16 partners. Like right now it's just me and Tim still. Like we don't have like a bunch of partners in there telling us what we can do, what we can't do. Um, we control we control the whole thing 100% right now today still. And so these things were important because, you know, a lot of people do the wrong decisions and do actually kind of like not think about the whole situation and everybody in the situation. Me and Tim really thought about that and um, we're going to surprise a lot of people with when we start season three and, and how we moving and how we're doing it. And um, it's been a documentary. Been, we've been shooting a documentary since Versus started mm. um, with Lena Waif and, and it's called Gifted in Black. So when people see this, it's going to all... It's gonna, it's gonna make a lot of sense. Yeah, I, I, I can't wait for it. I felt like that was, like that was the next thing. It was like this. It, it came at the perfect time. I remember watching you and Tim from your car until watching you guys go into live arenas. So the next phase, it, does it look similar or is it a completely new rebranding, new purpose for for how Versus is gonna look? Um, you know, one the break, the break was good. I felt that me and Tim needed the break. You gotta remember this started at a very intense time. Mm -hmm. So that means that we didn't get to properly like adjust from COVID and that whole vibe. We just, this took off during that time. And so, you know, um, I feel like the little break was cool. We got to rearrange some things in house, sit back, watch the tapes and know what we wanna do better and, and treat this like very professional because we're not in our basements anymore. This is now you know a couple of hundred stadiums worth of people watching you know and that's why i tell the artists like guys like y'all playing around like be on time be professional because this is probably the big, this is your biggest show ever mm -hmm. you know this is a couple of hundred stadiums watching you perform which is why the, even the artists like the isley brothers in in earth wind and fire like their streams went up 700 yeah. percent when those particular artists ain't supposed to stream see what i'm saying right. so so like we're breaking the mold and things where people are not investing into older artists because they don't think they stream. Okay, well, we just proved that wrong. And all of those artists from Versus went on major tours, major festivals. You ain't see it. You've seen the Shanti every day since Versus. <laughs> <laughs> and Ja. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's, it's just it's true. super powerful. And yeah. me and Tim, we got to take it. We, we say, yo, you know, we got to really take it serious. Like, this is, this is BT. This is something that the culture have that really help people for real yeah. you know like it's not just giving you a trophy like you are the trophy in versus yeah I, i'm thinking about your vision from an international standpoint does versus become something that crosses genres turns into international music yeah that's countries? already that's set 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 trust me <laughs> So are you still confident? Thriller, so they had a bunch of different delays in Triller, the Triller. Triller. They had a bunch of different delays in the IPO. You still confident in the, in the IPO when it yeah, comes I'm, out? Yeah, I'm confident because, you know, I'm, I'm confident in the IPO because any company could go public. You understand? It's just that, you know, um, the climate and everything is, is tough in the market, but I'm, they're going to go public for sure. They, it's just you have to. And, you know, any public, any company could go public. It's just that. SEC give you the green light based on what's in the filings and things like that, and you're ready to go. So, um, and I and I support it because um, all the artists are owners in Triller, you understand? And, and Triller own verses, mm -hmm. right? So, I thought that it was smart to put give the artist ownership in Triller. And me and Tim did that with our physical paper and our, our physical money. You understand? Mm -hmm. Like nobody's doing that. Like our lawyers, everybody thought we was crazy. But we didn't want to um, have Triller give the shares to the artists because then the artists 
by law would have had to do more work. They would have to earn because you can't just give out shares for free. Mm-hmm. It has to be, you know, a, a working document of why they're giving the shares. So I felt that the artists already did what they did by doing the verses. And that was a gift from, from, from me and Tim. Mm-hmm. All the artists, you know, um, got paid in different ways. You know, whether it was, you know, we never touched their endorsements. We never uh, touched any of their shows. We never touched any of it. And then we was like, you know what? Um, let's, 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 let's give this money. Let's, let's, let's put this back into the artists that did it. And we did it. We were about, you know, $20 million of our own money. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's real shit. Like, people, Out of your sh- you gave them part of your shares. Yeah, but like, we had allocated. To, yeah, but we had to do, it had to be cash. Oh, money. That turned, we had to do the cash. Then it turned and we had to buy the shares. Yeah, because they didn't have any physical yeah. money being spent. So that was the, yeah. wow. So as soon as that goes public though, and they're owners of it, they have an opportunity to actually have their shares, sell their shares? Or how, yeah, they can sell their shares. Yeah. Yeah, everybody, they can invest. Um, people could buy more shares, do what they want to do. But I just urge a lot of the artists to like look into it. You know what I'm saying? Because yeah. like a lot of people that got their shares, they don't, they don't, they not. I don't know if they following it or not. But yeah. you know, um, I urge every artist that got shares to look into it. You know, if you want more, add some more to it and follow up. You know what I'm saying? Because what happens is, I know I already know what's gonna happen when it go public. I'm gonna get all the phone calls. <laughs> how about so? You know what I'm saying? Like, yo, I want to, how am I supposed to get the money again? <laughs> I gotta open up a what? I, I gotta do my, what? Nah, I know I we, money. we lit. How, how? No, you, you told me, Swiss, when I my, signed my, my up. My accountant gonna call so we can get the bag. Yeah, yeah. No, motherfucker, yeah. it don't work like that. So <laughs> the structure changes. Does the structure change going forward? So the, the original, let's say, 40 people who are part of versus uh, before uh, the deal. They get that, but going forward, what happens to the artists who now participate? I think, I, I, honestly, you know, um, it was the, it was the people that we set it off with. Okay, you know, Makes you don't sense. have just endless shares. The, found, yeah. the foundation, found, the found, yeah, it's just the, the, it was the foundation. You know, and I feel like if that was done with hip hop, all of the pioneers would be straight. It's a fact. See what I'm saying? So like, it's about being the change that you want. You know, it's just like man, like the, the founders could have been a part of everything moving forward. Like, and they they would have been billionaires because this is a billion dollar business and the people that started hip hop like st- got problems with medical bills and stuff like that. It's just, re- it's just silly to me. What's, what's some of the biggest like hurdles or lessons that you learned from? I know it was a lot of issues from the sound to, I know dealing with artists, you know, their temperament, different things of that nature. Like what's some of the, the issues that you have? <laughs> <laughs> some of the issues, we all crazy. That's the issue. <laughs> we all crazy. That's just it. Like, but you know, like, um, man, we just all lucky to be doing what we love and you know everybody come from from serious backgrounds and you know a lot of the artists they just like this is all they have and and we just got to like we just got to step it up you know like we just got to we got to step it up with us you know what i'm saying like we step it up when it's those other shows we on time when it's those other shows we do those other shows for free Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? But just because it looked like us, the way that we want to pipe, we want to we want to pipe up on each other. You know what I'm saying? You want to charge me ten times your ten times your show. I just think I just don't I just don't I don't like that. You know what I'm saying? When when doing this show is ten times going to get you ten times more than those other shows, but you want to charge me ten times because you count on me and Tim's money. You know what I'm saying? That's just the ignorant stuff that we like to do to each other. And then talking about the culture, you know what I'm saying? Like, if you're really about it, then let's really be about it. Yeah, that's a fact. Yeah. So let's talk about this Saudi Arabia play. What? <laughs> Saudi <laughs> Bronx. What's Saudi, the Saudi, Saudi Bronx. Yeah, What's yeah, the yeah. Saudi play, man? Yeah, I, I see you over there all the time riding camels. <laughs> <laughs> did, did, he, did you ride one? I know you got the, the yeah. team. Nah, I don't ride. You ain't ride one yet. But you have a camel. I rode camels before, of yeah. course, but. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the you first got the racing team now, right? Yeah, I got the team. Yeah. When, yeah. I, when I see the sweatshirt, and it's just it's crazy because I see Sally Bronx, and I know it's fifty years of hip hop. I'm just thinking to myself, like, did you ever think hip hop would take it this far? That you would be in Saudi Arabia, never racing camels, never. I never thought that I would be the first American ever to own a Saudi racing team, and with with top five in the GCC period, um, it's really a big deal. You know, it started off as fun just being there and wanting to just do something different and just show people 
something different. I was just like, man, people should know about camel racing. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know camels could run. And it was started off as an educational thing that I wanted to show people. And now it's like, we really competing. Like we really are part of like the big finals and games. Like that's the one that Will Smith came to see the race. Yes. Happening during F1. And, um, and now Saudi Bronx is, you know, we, we made the sport global. You know, to where we, it's, it's the first time that camel racing has been a lifestyle. And it's, it's my company that's doing that, which is huge. It's, very, it's a very big thing. A lot of people is laughing at me with the camel stuff and, and they're not gonna laugh in five minutes because <laughs> it's, it's getting serious. <laughs> Yeah, I remember yeah. the first time seeing it, I thought they made a meme of it. I'm like, nah, this is different. Because I remember when you started traveling, and I'm like, he's not just going for no reason. There's, 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 there's something bigger yeah. here that's looking. So, I mean, I, I did the research on it. They said there's a plan, and maybe you can speak on it. <laughs> uh, they? Uh, they. <laughs> there's hey. a they. Be they. careful of they. There's a plan they. from the culture sector to contribute more than $23 billion to the Saudi economy and create over 100,000 jobs in the next 10 years. So there's a lot of opportunity. We're talking yeah, billions. The 2030 plan is, is, is pretty effective. Like imagine here in America, we had, we knew what, what, what the plans were to 2030, right? Right. And so what I respect what they did with the vision um, was everybody there know what jobs are available. They know the, the amounts that are allotted, that's allotted to those jobs. So you could sit back and say, Oh, they need the construction company. Oh, boom! Let's let me let me get let me get, let me get into this. Oh, they need um, designers. They need like you know what's needed to help take the, the country to the next level, and you can be a part of that. So there's hope and finance fi finances to to help you get to that vision. Yeah. You know, um, I don't. We don't know what we're doing tomorrow here. Your traveling has let you see that, right? So you know, we were talking about, we, we visited the UAE for the first time last year. Oh, okay. That's something that you have been doing since 2006. Yeah. And so you've seen it happen before. Were you more intrigued and more inspired to say like, oh, I saw it happen here. Here's another place where I, it hasn't happened yet, but I can be on the ground level with it? Yeah, I always, I, I always was a fan of, of the Middle East period. Uh, from the music, food, culture, fashion, and like the landscape of it, you know, it's just something that just always like connected me to it. I was in Dubai uh, when when the Palms wasn't even built yet. I shot the first video ever in Dubai in like '06. It was with the Jamero Group, and I was um, uh, advising them because they was at that time when people was coming to Dubai, it was. Um, they was making it like Wall Street, like just the guys with the suits. And I was like, nah, like this should be more like Miami. This should be Vegas. The beaches is beautiful. Look at the hotels. And so I just showed them um, how to structure that. You know, at the time, Sheikh Mohammed gave me the air rights um, for two years for two dollars. I remember having the letter written to him in Arabic, um, asking his permission. Um, but as far as that, that time, I wasn't. Oh, what's, the, what's the knowledge on that? What did he, he gave, say? What does that mean? He gave you the air rights for two dollars for two years. What's, which means that you please pass that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, don't the worry, so no one's listening. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so the air rights to to shoot a video, you know, for two years. Oh, yeah. So like, I had the two years lockout to shoot the particular content that I that I was doing, so it, it stayed exclusive. But I never put the video out. I just used the video. It was part of my presentation. The song's called You Stay On My Mind. I put it out one day. It was actually a letter to my wife. Mm. You know what I'm saying? That I, that I did this, this song and video um, at that time, but it was just to show them how um, Dubai could move in a different type of way. And, and you, know, you, you see Dubai today. So as far as like Saudi Arabia, what, what's your involvement? Are you like, Part, cause you know you said you're, you're part of a lot of different things there. Mm -hmm. What's your what's your like involvement there, and what do what do you see the future of Saudi Arabia? Because we all know that Saudi has so much money, yeah. um, but it's been labeled. You know, a, a lot of people look at it as a strict country, and yeah. different things of that nature. Not saying that it is. I'm just saying that's, no, no, that's I can, the perception I can that we have in America. Yeah. I so can. what's what's your vision, and how are you playing a part in Saudi? Well, me, I'm I'm a student of just cultures. Period. Um, 
when I first went to Saudi, I probably had the wrong mentality of like, yo, I'm gonna take this over, I'm gonna, I'm gonna own this and, and all of this stuff. But then I realized like, I don't need, I can't never own Saudi Arabia. It's, it's like, <laughs> what am I talking about? But that's just my, my American mentality instead of going there and being a student and just understanding the culture and the language and, and, and just curating the opportunities, you know? So my, my company there is called Good Intentions, right? Like, so camel racing, it's probably one percent of what I'm doing there, mm. you know. Like that's that's Saudi Bronx is literally like one percent of what I'm really doing there. But what I'm doing there is just um, being a student and then coming in with unique opportunities. Like I opened up a skating ring in Alula in the middle of nowhere, where in the villages and it's, it's free for the people um, every day. You know what I'm saying? So first skating ring in Saudi. That's from good intentions. You know, I have a a school that, that, that we're building there. We, we have a, a park that we're, that we're building there. Um, we have a creative farm that we're building there. Um, we got artist spaces. We got, it's, it's, it's a whole bunch of different things, but like my thing is I want to bring things to Saudi. Everybody's coming to take from Saudi. I think the smallest thing you can get from Saudi is money. The smallest thing? The smallest thing you can get from Saudi is money. It's a bar. See what I'm saying? And so, I just want to just lead by example. I could have been cashed out and, 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 and um, have nobody talk to me again. <laughs> <laughs> like a thief in the night. Like, it, it, <laughs> you know, like, night. and I just think a that, like, in the night. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Caught a lick. <laughs> but I don't, I just think that's like small thinking. Like, we thinking, because you overcharging for a show, you think you really did something like, if it was me, I'd do the show for free and really build a relationship. And that's just the difference of how I think and how like a lot of other people think. They think and they, 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 you can't rob two trillion. You know what I'm saying? You're robbing yourself. Mm -hmm. So go there open-minded and really connect the dots, sit down with people, you know, and, and get on that plane ride. I'm, I'm on that plane ride almost twice a month. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But I'm getting reward educational wise that's going I'm trying to build a 50 year plus relationship yes. I'm not trying to build a, a transactional relationship is it's silly I mean your work ethic I think that might be something that people really don't understand and overlook we were trying to sit down with you maybe a year ago in a, at Art Basel mm. and they were like he's only going to be here for six hours <laughs> I'm like six hours I'm like where's he coming from they said Saudi Arabia I was like okay is he going back? He's like, yeah, after he's going to Khaled's house and then he's going back. I'm like, he's going to be in Miami for six hours? I'm like, oh, yeah, this the is... plane was, the plane stayed. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is different. I'm eating dinner and I'm heading back. One of the things I think is overlooked as well, outside of the work ethic, is that who's with you? Mm. A lot of times, your kids are always with you. Yeah. And so they're seeing this, right? As an yeah, entrepreneur, yeah. as a father, how is this, how are you managing this? Because that's something that, I mean, as we're traveling. It's something we struggle with now, not having the kids. I know Nas mentioned it on Runaway, yeah. right? He was just yeah, like, was, yo, that's real I haven't been home since my first song. Sheesh. I'm giving her money, but she want to follow this. So how did you manage the balances? I really give it the hats off to my wife um, and Mo for helping me balance my schedule because we run so, so much that we can run past everything we love mm -hmm. and miss so many moments that we can never get back. And I just learned that you gotta make time, right? Like if I called you, even one of y'all tonight, no matter what you got going on, like, yo, I need you to be at my office tomorrow at 10 o'clock. I got $50 million for you. Y'all gonna figure out how to get to that meeting. <laughs> Plans canceled. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Everything <laughs> gonna shut down. Everything got your office tonight. <laughs> everything, got, everything got shut down. Yeah. So imagine for your family, which is priceless. Yeah. You understand? So you, you, you gonna move for 50 million but you're going to stutter step when it comes to the family and, and, and those moments you're never getting back, right? Mm -hmm. So you're going to pay with time or you're going to pay with money, right? So we got to make the time because, like, that money that you're spending on them kids, they don't care about it. You know what I'm saying? They're going to they be like, Dad, you know you never came to my game, and it's going to be like, oh, damn. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And mm -hmm. you done paid for the biggest party, you done paid for the clothes. They don't care about that shit. You know what I'm saying? They live it every day. Right, so the materialistic things is, is not, they're not caring about it like that because they, they don't live in the Bronx. They, they live in the Razor House. 
<laughs> right? So that time is like very important and um, little things like playing the video games with them and just doing things that they like. We want to do things that we like with the kids, but you got to do what they like. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So even now, like I'm just like sharpening it up more and more and just trying to get into their world, you know, and, and, and not make it about myself, but like keep it about the kids and to where they like, oh, they, 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 they feel fed. Mm. Well, before we leave, of course, we got to talk about music. You yeah. still you still oh, making yeah. music after all of this <laughs> oh, stuff. Oh yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, new project just dropped. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, where's your head right now with music? Obviously, you don't have to do music. You're not a hungry producer like you was when you first started. Um, yeah. But you're still making music. So I'm hungry as a motherfucker. All right. I don't do music unless I'm hungry, right? Like if I do something, I, I gotta I gotta I gotta play for real. You know, like this this hip hop fifty has started out with Nas asking me to do it two years ago. And it was like, yo, I just need five songs, five any songs. He made it like real quick, you know, pull something off the drive. Like it's, it's you know, just, I just want you to be the, the, the producer for New York representing. We got other producers. So I was like, all right, cool, let's do it. And by, when it came time to do it, which felt like very quick, I was just like, yo, everything got to count. You know, I can't like lean on what I did before. I got to like, put my feet in the paint today um, and, and work with the artists of today, work with the artists that started um, before the artists of today and, and, and give them a vibe for today and just let people know like, yo, if, if I'm in here, just know I'm about to, I'm, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a blow the whole place up. You know what I'm saying? So <laughs> that when, when you see me stepping out and, 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 and doing this, like they ass in trouble. Like is, this, this is the first of like, many explosions that's gonna happen. So just know, and, and I'm, I'm ready to zone with any of this. 50 years of hip hop. We, uh, we were out in Davos, Switzerland, with uh, mm -hmm. Dougie Fresh. And he told us about the five elements. It was like a whole history lesson. We hip hop, like we, hit, we love hip hop, we grew up in it. Mm -hmm. He said the MC, the DJ, beatboxer, graffiti, break dancing. I wonder what you think about the sixth element, which is what you're doing, entrepreneurship and business mm -hmm. at the highest level. Do you feel like this could be the sixth element that's been missing? I definitely think that education is the sixth element that's missing because imagine if all of the great artists that we know had the proper education to go with their creativity, everybody would be on 757s. Mm. You see what I'm saying? Like, the reason why the penny rate is still a part of the language in music is sickening to me. And the fact that we, we haven't challenged that yet is even more sickening, but it's just that um, you lean in with more of the side that's not educated. So you got a couple of people that's educated going against a whole army of our own that's not educated. So if you're not educated, you're going, you're going, um, you're going to sign up for it, but not show up mm -hmm. because you're scared to say that you don't know. We got to like admit that we don't know and, and fix it. Mm -hmm. You understand? Because too many, too many people in, in, are falling short to not having the education, and it's, it's silly. You know, like you, if you're in the music business, you need to know everything about that business. Like, you're not going to give your kid to a stranger. Like, music is your kid that you raising and putting all your life into. Why would you just give that to a stranger or a lawyer and just be like, "Yo, I'm not handling that. My lawyer going to deal with it." Nah, you are your lawyer. You need to check your lawyer too. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Because they getting hired by the bigger company. You just want to count the thousands. You understand? So having the education, I understand why they just like never really promoted it to us. It's, it's very serious. It's mm -hmm. dangerous. It's like, it's the difference of you getting a million to a billion is your education. And that's why I like, that's the sixth element to me because when you sit down with the artists and I know a lot of the artists are not calling me about the IPO because they don't even know what it mean. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, we gotta start saying we don't know and let's create a, 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 a confidential conference or something where it's okay not to know. Like, we came from the streets. You know what I'm saying? Like, Rough Riders started from the streets. Like, my uncles and them, like, all they knew was the streets. We just happened, they just happened to become 100 millionaires off of the streets. There wasn't no educational part to it. Mm -hmm. And it's okay, you know what I'm saying? And so I went back to school in my late 30s. It's, it's never too late, you know what I mean? Like, we, we sh 
the minute that we, we stop learning is when we stop living, right? So you got to like continue feeding yourself. The world is turning too fast. Now you got the AI app. Motherfucker, <laughs> 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 write a book for you. About, about to make 17 Swiss beats. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. That's a fact. But one thing, even with the AI, when I tell people, everybody going to go back to the authentic shit and they're going to go back to quality. They, it, it, that stuff is going to make the quality even more important. You understand? Like, you could imitate Jay-Z and imitate everybody with the AI, but there's really a Jay-Z. There's really, like, you know what I'm saying? That's like getting a fake watch. Like, okay, <laughs> you could front with the fake watch until watch busters run down on you. Watch busters. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so with the AI, people going to know they, it's going to, people going to want the real shit even more. So, you know, and even, like, the people building the AI, just think about the artists. While y'all having fun, like this, this is real poetry. Mm -hmm. Artists really, this, this really saved our, our culture. You know, like music really, like, our culture without music, <laughs> we'd be in bad shape. No, uh, Swiss, appreciate you, man. You said something that was very insightful. You're like, education is so important. You said that artists aren't calling you because they're not even educated enough. You gotta be educated to even ask a question. Like yeah. Even as you have a little bit of education to ask the question. So I appreciate this conversation because I'm sure that it'll enlighten and hopefully just inspire somebody to further their education. Like you never know, like you just hear one thing and that leads you down a whole rabbit hole of trying to find out what the next thing, mergers and acquisition, IPO, and then before you know it, you got 15 hours in and you know that, that, that leads to something. So I think that it's important yeah. that we have these conversations. It's also important that we highlight people like yourself mm -hmm. for not just what you're known for as far as music, and that's great, but I feel like it's gonna be even more of an impact mm. what you're doing socially in the arts and in business, really, yeah. internationally. That's mm. something that, you know, more people can probably aspire to because your musical talent is God-given, but very few people are gonna reach that level of success, but, you know, anybody can, can do business yeah. and, um, and travel and, and, you know, work with different people. So that, to me, is, is more important to tell that story. So. Glad that we got a chance to do that. Now we have to. Like, I'm, I'm, I have to get the information. Even if the other people watching on the other side is uncomfortable about it, sometimes the real shit be uncomfortable, but we can't run from it. You know what I'm saying? Like, what's really uncomfortable is knowing that you don't know and don't know how to say you don't know. That's uncomfortable. Mm. That's a fact. See what I'm saying? So we got to get the ego out the way and, like, and just free yourself. You know what I'm saying? Like, when I went in class, I was scared to death because I haven't been educated for so long, and these people in the class are real serious. I started raising my hand three times a day, even if it was the wrong <laughs> answer. But then, shit, the people that I was in the class that I was respecting, I, I was smarter than them. They ain't know it either. I started telling them more about their business than, than it wasn't my business. So just raising my hand three times in the class, like 90% of the times I was right because we got something in the culture that a lot of coaches don't have, and that's common sense. You know what I'm saying? Like, we got common sense. People don't be having common sense. Like, yo, the, the light is red, but you see the car coming 500 miles. No, but the rule is to keep the light red. All right, well, you, you know what we gonna do. We ain't stepping in the street. Don't do it. Not that's one time. We not doing it. That's a fact. Nah, it's appreciate it. you, my brother. It's been, Thank it's you. Been, it's been an absolute honor. And when, when, we, when we go to Saudi, we, we'll hit you up. Anytime, be my guest. <laughs> yes. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. So it's beast, ladies and gentlemen. A wrap on the home. set. Yeah. That was dope, man. Oh, Appreciate man. you, bro. That was dope. This is a fast financial fact sponsored by Xfinity. This week's fact, choosing the right watch can indeed be a great investment. It's important to note that while some watches have a potential to be great investments, the majority of watches are not usually purchased with the investment purpose in mind. The watch market can be unpredictable and factors such as trends and economic conditions can affect the value of watches. Therefore, it is advisable to consult with experts and do thorough research before making any significant watch investments. Assets Over Liabilities is presented by Xfinity.